Greetings. My name is Sue Eaton, and I'm the Kentucky Conference Older Adult Team Leader. I am glad that you have chosen to join us today and to be part of this webinar entitled Ministry to, with, and for those in the second half of life. I am a boomer and in the second half of life. So this relates to me as well as to those in your congregation. People in the second half of life come in all shapes and sizes, in different levels of activity and many health concerns. Everyone wants to be active as long as they can be. And boomers believe that 60 is the new 40. And then there are those who need the rest of us in order to, to stay connected to God and to the church. In this webinar, I will attempt to share with you how you can have a ministry in your local congregation to, with, and for those in the second half of life. If at all possible, it needs to be an intentional ministry with a focus on older adults and those in the second half of life. Our churches and society are experiencing a change in demographics. More and more as we look out on our congregations, we're seeing more and more gray. And that is only going to increase as the boomers continue to retire. But it's important to notice, to note that people of all ages are called to be faithful witnesses of God's love. And the church is called to equip all persons, regardless of age and health, to live out their Christian discipleship in significant ways. A green congregation is not an old church but a church that is blessed by having many older members. Provide those in the second half of life with new opportunities for learning and serving, and you'll see change in your church. Help senior adults find meaning and purpose for their lives. It's important. As they were younger, they were raising their children. They were uh, going forward in their careers. They were developing relationships, and that brought meaning and purpose to their lives. Now the children are grown and hopefully out of the home. Um, careers are winding down. And what will the meaning and purpose be for their lives for the second half of their lives? It's important that we as the church affirm and challenge those in the second half of life. 71% of older adults indicate that their health is good to excellent. And if that's the case, they're very capable of being involved in their communities and in their church in various ways. The church can be a warehouse filled with rocking chairs while people wait to die. Or it can be a place of learning and equipping to send people out to their community and the world to tell their story of faith and to serve the least, the last, and the lost. But it's up to the church to make that decision, to do that equipping and that training. It's important that we provide spiritual nurture and healing for all people and provide support systems for grief and loneliness. We are called to grow in our spiritual lives, all of our lives. And so it's important that we continue to move forward. There's always something to learn from God's word. There's always more we can learn about prayer and more we can put into practice and ways in which we can, we can nurture other people and help them to heal at times of grief and loneliness. Healing has always been an important ministry in the church. Boomers are the largest untapped group who will need help aging. So many boomers are in denial. They figure if they, use, if they 
cease to use the word old, then it will never become reality for them. They are unprepared for retirement and aging. They're not planning for it financially or emotionally, and they're going to need help. Boomers provide a great opportunity to make disciples. They want to share their faith. They want to have purpose for their lives. They want to make every day count. And so if we can train them to be disciples and to make disciples, they can reach out to their friends and their family and people that they know in order to bring them into the church, bring them into salvation. Many boomers lost touch with the church during their adult lives and now are, are beginning to come back. More than 10,000 boomers retire every day. But it's important to realize that boomers have a different culture than preceding seniors. Boomers grew up uh, at the time of the Vietnam War and all of the chaos and unrest and uh, things that went, went on during that time. Boomers grew up and saw the assassination of President Kennedy and his brother Bobby, as well as Martin Luther King Jr. They went through uh, desegregation and the race riots. And they have, they have come to the point where they don't trust institutions in America today. They are different. They don't look to government to answer all their questions. They want to be more involved in, in the answers and how that's going to play out. So we don't treat boomers the same way we treat those in the previous generation. It's a totally different way of doing ministry. Please note that boomers were born between 1946 and 1968. And as I said, many are not prepared for retirement. So why should the church invest in ministry to, with, and for those in the second half of life? It will strengthen the local church. The more people we have, sharing the gospel, the stronger our church will be. The more people who are having their spiritual needs met, we will have uh, them going out and reaching others for Christ. It will put an excitement in your church, a vision of hope. If the church makes investment in this, that church will make disciples, and those disciples will go out and make more disciples. We can involve more people in ministry. It will give their lives meaning and purpose. It will provide a sense of caring for others and being cared for. Do you have any shut-ins, lonely people in your congregation? Are you caring for them? Do you have any caregivers? Do they have that sense that there's a, a church family behind them holding up their arms when they want to drop them? Being there to encourage and to help. It will promote the importance of wellness. It's a whole lot more fun to exercise if you're in a group than you're trying to do it all by yourself. It will help people grow spiritually. We are never in this life completely perfect. We can always grow. It will provide education experiences. Hopefully those in the second half of life in your congregation still have their desire to learn. It will build community. God created us for community. We need each other. And it's a safe place for seniors throughout the community. The National Council on Older Adults reports that approximately one in 10 Americans, 60 or older, have experienced elder abuse. That abuse can be emotional, physical, 
and or financial. That means if you have 30 people, 30 people over the age of 60 in your congregation, then three of those have been experiencing elder abuse. Some estimates range as high as 5 million older Americans are abused each year in this country. And one study established that only one in 14 cases of abuse are reported to authorities. Does the church need to train our people to recognize the red flags of elder abuse? Do you know what they are? Do you need to open up a workshop to your community so that others can come and learn? It's another way to strengthen your church and provide caring um, ministry for people. So I want to share with you now 10 best practices for ministry, two with and for those in the second half of life. To begin with, know your people. Do your homework. Take a survey of all of the people over the age of 50 in your congregation. Make sure that everyone fills out that survey. Ask them some of the questions face to face. That will give you more of an opportunity to share with them what you're looking for and get that survey back from them. Now you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to share with you uh, at the end of this presentation some books that have sample surveys in them that you can take and pick and choose what you need for your congregation. It's important that you know your people. You need to know their level of capability. Are they very active? Are they semi-active? Are they um, at least partially disabled and unable to do um, a whole lot? How involved do they want to be? Do they want to be in leadership or do they just want to attend? Do they want to start a new group? What do they want to do? And what are they interested in? You need to know those things before you can go any further. But you will not know what the needs are unless you ask. It's also important that you know older adult issues and themes. Depression and despair among those that are over 50 is more prevalent than you probably think it is. Grief and loss, anxiety and security, loneliness and isolation all feed into that depression and despair. Death preparation. Are you giving your congregation help in that? Change. Change is hard. Try to put your, yourself in the place of someone who has lived in the same house her entire adult life. And the time has arrived when her family believes it's time for her to enter a nursing home or skilled care. And she knows she has to leave that home for the last time and enter a nursing home and she will never return home again. Put yourself in her place and think about how that would make you feel. She needs your help. She needs her church to surround her, or he does, at that point in time. Know their issues and themes. Poverty. Poverty is more prevalent than you think it is among older adults. Especially for women. So often when a husband passes away, his pension goes with him. And she's left with Social Security because she spent her adult life staying home and taking care of the home and raising the children. And now she doesn't have what she needs. And often they have to choose between medicine and food. If she comes to a potluck dinner, she may have to skip dinner for four nights 
in order for those ingredients to go into that dish she brings to share. Is, the, is there a way that the church can provide an out of the way food closet for her or for him? Where they can come and, and quietly get some canned goods that will tide them over to the next month and keep their dignity? Think about it. Wellness and illness is always an issue and, and theme with older adults. Elder abuse, suicide, Alzheimer's and dementia, and caregiving. Caregiving is exhausting. It's never ending. And there's no day off. Think about what you can do for caregivers. Form a committee. Begin with prayer. Ask God to send you the people that he wants to be on this committee that could provide the most input and creative energy. Look for someone in each Sunday school class that has members over 50 years of age. Involve those who are single, married, and widowed. Be sure you involve all three, if you have all three in your congregation. Ask people who are very interested in working with this age group. And if you are interested in doing intergenerational ministry, include a parent of a child and a youth. Write your mission statement. Make it simple and clear and easy to follow. This mission statement is like a rudder on a ship. It gives you direction and it keeps you on course. Whenever you plan things, you can always go back to that mission statement and ask yourself, does this event, does this opportunity meet with our mission statement? It will help you keep on what you have decided to do and what your focus is. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Set goals and objectives. These need to be reasonable, they need to be realistic, and they need to be measurable. Choose a name for your group that is inclusive. Words like older adults, seniors, golden elders, uh, mature, all are names that are not acceptable to boomers. Some safe names are actives, BBs, boomers, encores, experienced, grown-ups, teenagers, primers, and seasoned. But really the best idea of how to do it is to ask your group to brainstorm and come up with some possible names and then let them choose what they want to be called. They're a lot more accepting in, of it if they have bought into the process. Dream big, but live in reality. Plan a program. Decide what you want to offer and where you want to begin. Is it a monthly meal and speaker or activity? Could it be a Bible study that is relevant to their needs and age group? Or a seminar, such as one on elder abuse or the gift of finishing well? That's a six-part workshop on uh, helping people prepare for the end-of-life issues. And if you want more information on that, let me know. I'll be glad to send you that. Realize that providing a quality program and will bring quantity to, to your program. So take care, careful note of what you're presenting. A committee can plan the first six months. And halfway through, begin to ask your members what they would like for the rest of the next six months. Plan different things for those six months. 
for instance, have a music service, bring in a musician or have a hymn sing, Christmas time, have a carol sing. Um, you could set up a schedule, do many things that could be done. You could have a field trip. You could have a dermatologist come in and talk about how to spot skin cancer, have a service project one time, maybe have your pastor come and share what his or her faith journey has been like, and then set up the schedule and let everyone know what it is. Recruit your leadership. Who's going to lead the group? Who's going to be the speaker? Have that confirmed. Uh, in writing. Do you need a piano player, uh, a song leader, hymnals? What do you need? Is your leader going to need um, PowerPoint, use of the computer? Uh, make sure everything's ready and prepare your facilities. Do a facilities assessment. Uh, are there things in your church that need to be changed that will make it easier for people to come and to get in? and to be there. Coordinate publicity, establish a budget, and evaluate. Evaluation is important. If you want to continue to make your program better and better, then evaluation after each event is very important. Each member of your committee or your board should have an evaluation sheet to fill out after each program that says what we did right and what we did wrong, what we need to change, what we can leave, what worked best, what didn't work at all, and any other comments. And then when your committee comes together again, you collate those, you discuss them, and your secretary makes a final copy that is she or he will file and have on hand to use as you're planning more programs. Publicity is absolutely vital. Use every in-church communication tool that you can. Your bulletin, your newsletter, the calendar for the church, Facebook and Twitter. Now you may think that uh, people in of the age of 60 or over don't use Facebook and Twitter, but a lot of them do. And even if they don't, you may reach someone through that way that you couldn't reach any other way. So it's important to use every in-church communication tool that you can. Develop a special mailing for those over 50. The committee can divide the names of those in your congregation over 50 and call them. Develop an email list and a snail mail list. There are those who don't have email, and sometimes it's because of financial constraints. Don't leave them out. Just type out, print out the announcement and stuff it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and send it on its way. It's important that they know that you care enough to do that for them. Put up a poster in community places where people from the community will see them, but always remember to ask. Ask yourself the question, is my church building handicap accessible? Borrow a walker or a wheelchair and make your way into and around the building. Be sure to check the bathrooms. If they can't get in easily, they won't come. Are there changes the trustees need to consider? Do you need a ramp? Do you need a chair lift? Maybe you don't have room for a handicapped stall in the bathrooms, but if you at least put bars in there, it will help a great deal for someone who's handicapped. And that is not a great deal of expense. Are people not coming because they can't hear the preacher? Do you need to look into hearing devices? Do you provide large print bulletins and hymnals for your people? Think about these things. 
as you move forward to make it as easy for people as possible. It says to them that you care. Meet your congregation's specific needs. Boomers, those born from 1946 to 1968, need more active programs. You need to plan things like a 20 mile cycling trip, uh, trips out of the state to, to places they'd like to visit. Uh, a short-term work group in, at Redbird Mission. And there are people, even in the previous generation, who will want to be involved in some of those and be able to do some of those things. So plan things, if you're gonna put your groups together, boomers and the previous generation. Plan things that are more active, more task-oriented, and things that are, are less active for those who are physically unable to do the active things. And then just announce everything to everyone and let everyone choose what they want to do. Are there people who need help, visits, a ride, etc.? That's <clears throat> what you learn from your surveys. That gives you the opportunity to meet their need, but it also gives those of us who are able to help, able to visit, able to stop and pick them up, an opportunity to be a disciple, an opportunity to be involved in ministry, to have a purpose, a reason to get up in the morning. Are there spiritual needs being met? Are they in a Bible study? Are they in a prayer group? Are they coming to worship? If they aren't coming to worship, why not? Find out. Maybe it's something that can be fixed. Does your program provide sound biblical teaching with a balanced ministry of love and care? Balance is so important. Are there caregivers in your congregation who need encouragement and a break? Different churches are doing different things to reach out to caregivers in their congregation. At St. Matthew's United Methodist Church in Louisville, they plan and carry out a caregiver's tea three times a year. They plan for months a special invitation around a theme a special menu around a theme, special decorations, special things to do. They bring in a special speaker to, brought, to provide encouragement. But those caregivers come and they are treated like queens and kings at that, sir, at that program. They are welcomed with such love and such care and told just how special and precious they are. They are seated and they are waited on. Someone else pours their tea. Someone else provides them with goodies they don't have time to fix at home. Someone else takes care of their every need while they're there and provides little gifts for them. They don't have to cook it. They don't have to clean up after it. They don't have to take care of themselves. Someone else takes care of them for that few hours. And it's very important for them to feel that love and that concern and that encouragement. So think about what you could do in your congregation for the caregivers. If you know of a church or you, your church does something, I would appreciate it if you would email that to me and I will share it with everyone in Kentucky in our churches that someone else might get an idea that they could do for their congregation. Intergenerational activities. People over 50 have much wisdom to share. Now they will tell you they don't have any wisdom, but they do. 
Young people and older adults are both interested in our ecosystem. Build on that. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should send 80-year-olds out to pick up litter along the, the banks of the Ohio River. But there are other things that young people and older adults can do together to work on our ecosystem. Things they could do within the congregation or within the community. Just get them started and they'll take it from there. Confirmation class mentors. Ask your people, for those people over 50, to agree to walk hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, with the confirmand at the next confirmation class in your congregation. Encourage them to meet on a regular basis. Possibly just going to McDonald's and, and talking over a Coca-Cola or whatever. It doesn't have to be something expensive. Going to a park, sitting on a bench, walking for a while and sitting on a bench and sharing with each other. Sharing values. Sharing your faith. Let that older adult share how God has been with them throughout their lives or how they came to the Lord as an adult and how God has been with them through the mountaintops and the valleys about the doubts that they've had, the questions that they've raised. It will form a whole new relationship between them that could carry on for the rest of their lives. Visit a children's Sunday school class to read a book or tell their faith story to the children. Imagine an older adult coming and sitting in a children's Sunday school class, sitting down on one of those low chairs and looking at them at eye level and saying to them, when I was your age, I sat in a Sunday school class just like this. In fact, they had chairs just like the one I'm sitting in. And when I was your age, my favorite Bible, Bible story was about David. And you want to know why I like David? And then let them tell how that has affected their faith story. Adopt a grandparent. Many grandchildren today do not live in the same town as their grandparents. I have two grandchildren in Southern uh, California and two grandchildren in North Carolina and two more in Versailles. So I don't see my grandchildren on a, on a daily or even a weekly basis. And my children didn't live near their grandparents. They were two states away. And I know my children would have benefited from having a church grandparent who would just be friendly to them, smile, talk to them, maybe share a card at Christmas time or Easter. Someone who could have a part in their lives as much as the parents wanted it to be. But whatever you do in intergenerational activities, whether it be with youth or children, it's important that you practice safe sanctuaries. Adults working with children or youth need training and a background check. This is not negotiable. It's for everyone's protection. Outreach. Make outreach a priority in your group. Make sure that everyone understands the importance of sharing the group with others. Not only those in the church, but those that they know in their neighborhood, through Kiwanis Club, that they play golf with, any number of things that they are involved in um, out in the world that they invite those people to come to the group, that they know what the next program's going to be, and they tell them 
and encourage them to come and be part of it. Help them to learn to tell their story of faith. If people know how to give a concise, accurate story of their faith and how God has been involved in their lives from the beginning, they will share it more often. God gives us opportunities all the time to share that story, but we so often miss it or we're afraid or we're scared to laugh at us. Tell them to make a goal to lead someone to Christ this year and God will lead that person to them. Lead them, tell them, learn, teach them how to tell their story of faith and how to lead someone to Christ. And once that gets started, your church will change. Have immediate follow-up with those who are missing. Not to find out why they weren't there, but to say to them, we care and we missed you. Imagine someone who got up the morning of the program and were just so deep in depression that they didn't feel like even getting out of bed that morning. And then someone calls them that afternoon to say, we missed you. They'll probably be there the next time. So often, people need to know that we care. Special event posters in local businesses and local offices are important, but remember to ask. Make people feel welcome when they come. Be intentional about this. Don't assume it will happen automatically. If you've got a good sized group, ask six, six people to be greeters for your program and post them at different places around the doors. And when someone new comes in, that greeter can introduce themselves, can take them to get a name tag, can get some information on them so you can keep contact with them, and then introduce them to someone else in the group that they can talk to. They don't have to worry because there's five other people at the door. If five other people come in, that are new to take care of them. It doesn't happen automatically. It needs to be intentional. And you need to make sure that it happens, that everyone is greeted, but especially those who are new. Use name tags. And you may think, well, we don't need name tags. We all know who each other is. And that may be true. But there are a couple good reasons for it. You'll make permanent name tags for your members and have stick-on name tags for, for visitors for the first few weeks until they become members. But if you just have a name tag on a visitor, they feel like they stand out. They feel different. They don't feel like they're one of the group. And when they walk up to someone who doesn't have a name tag on, they're uncertain as to what to do and how to do that. And if you have name tags on everyone, everyone's on level ground. I don't know about you, but as I age, I'm getting less and less able to recall everyone's name. And if everyone has a name tag, then I can glance at that name tag and know their first name very quickly and can call them by name. It takes away any nervousness or uneasiness. It makes everybody relax and be comfortable. It's very helpful. I know there's a little bit of expense there, but it is important to make people comfortable. They will return if they're comfortable and they feel welcomed and they feel wanted. So consider that.
short-term missions. People, especially boomers, want their time and energy to count for something. And it's important that you provide a variety of mission projects. Short-term international missions are going on in many local churches. If your church is doing one, make sure your people know about it so that they can be part of it if that's what they wish to do. You find out what kind of mission it is. Some of the international missions are building uh, buildings and, and refurbishing buildings, painting and, and uh, gardening and things. Uh, are your people physically able to do that? And some international missions are more like vacation Bible schools and English lessons, where you don't need a strong physical uh, skills and abilities in order to do it. If your church isn't having one this year, ask your pastor if there are any other churches in the area or in your district who are. Call your district superintendent and ask them. Check your web page for the Kentucky Conference. Uh, every year, the Kentucky Conference sponsors um, an international mission of some sort. Find out what's happening and see where you can plug in and be part of that. Or start one yourself. Recruit some people. And then ask for the support of your congregation. You don't have to have... 25 people to do an international mission. You can have five. It will change their lives. I guarantee it. Look for projects, mission projects that people can do at the church. The United Methodist Committee on Relief has on its webpage three different kits that you can make. You gather all of the materials and bring them in and pack them together. There is a school kit, there is a health kit, and there is a cleanup kit. UMCOR will be in the Carolinas and in, in Virginia this weekend after that hurricane passes to provide cleaning kits and aid in whatever way that they can. Because as the people come back home, they're going to find a great deal of destruction and they're going to need all the help they can get. And UMCOR will be there probably before the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. So think about projects like that. Think of ideas of things they can do at home, like knit or crochet hats for babies. Um, Make prayer shawls that can be shared with people in the, in the congregation who are in the hospital or in a nursing home. If you go online and ask and search for charity projects, a lot of ideas will come up of things that you can do at home or in your, or in your meetings. Form a choir or a band and go to a local nursing home. Choir doesn't have to have 50 members or 200 members. It can have five or four, whatever, with a guitar or a pianist or just a cappello. Share, brighten someone's day, encourage them. Visit and take Holy Communion to those who cannot get out and understand that people are looking for purpose and meaning for their lives. What can I do today to make a difference in someone's life is the question that they asked. Laugh with those who laugh and cry with those who cry. We're almost finished. Humor is a golden key for all ages, but especially for people over 50. As I said earlier, uh, humor and laughter is a great help toward, um, toward depre healing depression and despair. Laughter releases um, endorphins and helps us heal. 
Start your group meeting with a, with a good joke every time, a good, clean joke, a short joke, but a good one that makes everybody laugh. Start out your meetings that way. Know when to laugh, when to be silent, and when to cry with them. So often we think that if we're going to reach out to someone who's hurting, who's grieving, who's concerned about a loved one, that we have to have all the right words to say. But that's just not true. What we need is to be with them, to hold them as they cry, as long as they cry, to sit with them and be silent and hold their hand, to be with them when they need us, when after the funeral, everybody goes home and there's so much loneliness. They may not feel like getting out, but they would eat a hamburger from McDonald's if you'd buy it and take it to them and sit down and eat with them. Just be a friend. It speaks more than the words. Laughter and good positive humor are wonderful medicine for hurting hearts. Proverbs 17.22 says, A cheerful heart is good medicine but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. We all know that. And it can be a ministry for anyone and everyone. Now I'd like to share some books with you that are great for those in the second half of life, <clears throat> especially for those working with um, that age group. An Age of Opportunity by Richard Gessler, is a fairly new book. Richard Gessler is a United Methodist. In the past, he ran the Office for Older Adults and Discipleship Ministries. And um, he has a very good book that is very practical uh, with a lot of how-tos, ideas for field trips, ideas for uh, programming, uh, ideas for many different things that you can do with your group. He also has many um, samples of letters, of uh, disability assessments, of, of surveys, and uh, other various things. Senior Adult Ministry by Dr. David Gallagher also has many of those samples and is a very practical book. I would recommend both of these, especially if you're starting a new group or you're looking for new ideas. Aging Faithfully by Missy Buchanan. All of her books are good, and she's written many. She's a United Methodist, uh, and she'll also be a workshop leader at the Festival of Wisdom and Grace in August of next year. So I encourage you to look at her books. Uh, Ten Gospel Promises for Later Life is a wonderful Bible study by Jane Tebolt. Jane is a friend of mine, is a resident of Louisville, and is also a United Methodist. And it's a wonderful gospel Bible study that uh, this book leads you through that your people might enjoy. At the Crossroads by Clayton Smith and Dave Wilson. Uh, Clayton Smith recently retired from the big uh, Resurrection United Methodist Church in Kansas. It's a book for, especially for those um, baby boomers who are looking toward or have just retired. Uh, and how they can find that purpose and meaning in their lives. It's a small group study. And Remembering Your Story by Richard Morgan is another good one, as it, it's more like a workbook uh, that helps you tell your story of faith and how you can do that, not only to share with, with someone on the outside of the church, but also to videotape and leave for your family of how faith has impacted your life. I have a couple of web resources for you. The first one is the Kentucky Conference website. If you type that in, it will take you to a page with uh, small squares of different ministries and just scroll down till you find older adults and click that on. Uh, that 
page is up and running. I put new articles on there of ideas, of things to do about boomers, of um, how to how we can make disciples, how older dis older Americans or older adults can be disciples right now, um, and many other things, announcements and various things. So. Please take note of that. I changed the articles, although they're kept in a in a file. They're on the on the site, so you can look at the ones that have been published in the past. But I print new ones um, every couple of months. The second one is for Discipleship Ministries. The older adult office at Discipleship Ministries has been eliminated but they have kept the web page. And there are a lot of webinars, um, a lot of um, articles on there that are very helpful. And so uh, go ahead and check that out and see if there's something you can use. Uh, I talked about the um, workshop on helping people prepare for end of life issues uh, called Good Death. And um, there is a webinar on there about that. So you can learn more about that or you can contact me and I'll be glad to share any information with you. Here's my information. Please feel free to call, to text, to email me uh, about anything regarding this webinar. If you would like me to send you uh, by email the slides that I used on the PowerPoint, I will be glad to, to do that. That's no trouble at all. Just let me know that you'd like it. Uh, any questions I can answer, any suggestions you have for the conference, uh, I am looking for people to serve on my team. If you are able and willing to do that, I welcome you. Just let me know. I hope you have enjoyed this webinar. I hope that uh, you will learn something from it that you can use in your group or to begin a group and that it will be helpful. I pray blessings on you as you move forward, working with this age group and helping them to become the disciples God wants them to be. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>